I had not really was not familiar with the term default uh, mode network until I started reading your papers. Mm -hmm. And then I did recall, yes, I have encountered this somewhere before in my readings, but uh, I'd been, I'd forgotten it. And I certainly began to see now that you, you clarified it for me because I'm still trying to get my head around what exactly it was and what part of the brain functioning in your, 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 uh, your re reactions to whatever is going on at the moment, because I know I'm I'm one of those that I can go into this kind of reverie of daydreaming about stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and sometimes I find that in that kind of state of mind, when I least expect it, and I'm not even trying to consciously connect two things that I've been thinking about, almost as independent or parallel streams of thought, and then suddenly they merge. Um, will oftentimes kind of happen in that state. Now, you mentioned psychedelics can can sort of, in a way, deactivate the DMN, the default mode network. Is, yeah. Do I understand that? That's one of the functionings, as well as, as um, meditation. Now, I've done both, and uh, I think that I've experienced what you're talking about. Uh, certainly, no question on psychedelics. The idea of self completely changed during those experiences. Self became something completely beyond any idea of what self was prior to that. Now, I did the psychedelics before I got into a rigorous uh, program of meditation. I didn't stay with it, but I did stay with it for enough years that, and it was pretty intense, pretty in depth, and it was certainly enough to see that. Yes, something was obviously going on in my neurocircuitry. I couldn't have talked about what it was scientifically uh, at all. I mean, we're talking now in the in the early seventies, mm -hmm. but it most certainly uh, and, and and well, it was like this. I mean, you've since you've meditated, you know that the idea is you you focus on something. Like in the case of my um, practice, it was a mantra. Uh, and it was a brief, primarily mantra and breathing that were coordinated together, and you focused on that. And after you begin to get the uh, somewhat accomplished at, at this really intense focusing, it would be the analogy I used was that it was almost like um, if you're looking into a piece of glass and you've got light on your side and it's dark on the other side, you're going to just see the reflection of you. You're not going to see what's on the other side and in my of the glass, right? Because it's dark. Now, if you turn down the lights on the side you're on while you're turning the lights up on the other side, all of a sudden you see there's this whole other world on the other side. And now I'm kind of almost thinking it's like, is it, is it, would this be a pr appropriate metaphor? Is that if you're turning down the light on this side, in making this dark, is that almost like damping down the activity of the default mode network? Is that what happens? That's not the worst Something metaphor. Like yeah, because and and that is what ha what we see in the literature is that what one of the things that meditators learn how to do is they learn how to willfully turn down their default mode network. Okay, then then okay, that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, and I never thought of it that way before. Um, but yeah, because it was almost as if you're so engaged in processing the inputs, the sensory input that you're, you're missing that there's this whole realm that's outside what you can perceive with your five senses. And it's just as real as what you're perceiving. Perhaps, I mean, are we seeing frequencies that because uh, I know certainly if we're talking about our eyesight or our hearing, we are definitely talking about frequencies and our, you know, our, our audio capabilities and our optical capabilities are responding to certain frequencies, certain inputs of frequencies. And beyond those, you know, I can hear up to a point, but, you know, bats using sonar to communicate with one another are like hearing on a whole different level. Right. And it's just as real, even though I have no perception of it. Mm hmm so that was what I got out of both psychedelics and meditation. Right. Was that, and, and when you can learn to turn off the hyperactive inputs from the sensory world out here, you suddenly realize or experience that there's this whole other realm. 
I the metaphor I always used was like I tried to describe it like I entered the great hall or the great temple, almost like another metaphor would be if you're sitting in a box, right? And this box is whatever it's enough room for you to move, but you're sitting in there, and then all of a sudden the walls of the box fall away, and you're sitting in a much bigger box. And then those walls dissolve, and you're sitting in a much bigger box yet. And and it, for me, that was like the process of there was these enclosures, these walls enclosing my reality, and they would, by stages, each dissolve, and there would be a greater perception of, of reality. That was kind of a, I mean, I've struggled, as you know what I'm talking about. To, you, you struggle to look for words to metaphors to describe this experience, and there aren't really any. Yeah. Because it, it's something beyond words in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of stuff to say to this. Um, uh, well, one, one piece I'll, I'll start with. I like your, um, your glass window metaphor. The one, the one that I've always used is that it's like the surface of a pond. And if there's a lot of turbulence on the surface of the water, all you see is the surface. And then if it goes still, then you can see through and you can see the depth. You can see the depth, and, yes. And that's always, that's a good something like that has always been my experience with meditation, where it usually takes me like at least 30 minutes or more of sitting before I feel like it starts to go still. And, mm -hmm. and but it is like you're, like you're talking about, there are these kind of layers of, of stillness. And, um, this is one of the things that it's the, the, the contemplative science, the contemplative neuroscience field right now is it's a super exciting place to be because 20 years ago, the field was just trying to say, Hey, look, meditation is a thing. It's a, it's a unique brain state and it has mm -hmm. all these positive benefits. There's all this well being, all this, all these amazing health effects that can come from a good meditation practice, sometimes as short as a two week course can dramatically alter um, everything from your cortisol to your blood pressure to your, you know, subjective experience. Um, and so first it was like the field was just trying to kind of prove that, um, that meditation should be taken seriously. And then now we're kind of past that point and, and there's kind of a systematic approach to describing all the different types of meditation that you can do. Um, like you described a mantra, that's one type. You can also, you can talk about what you're doing with your attentional lens. Are you focusing it in on something very small and specific? Like, the sensation of breath on the on your nostrils or are you widening that lens out to get this full view of your entire sensorium and the the, the two you know those as kind of two fundamental dualities in 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 the practice they engage the brain differently they have different kinds of effects and um and this is some of the things that the, the field has been kind of taking apart. Um, and, you know, we can talk about like which parts of the brain get engaged when you focus on specific things versus what happens when you relax that muscle to allow all that bottom up data to filter its way up to your consciousness. Um, but then the, the other piece that you're talking about where you feel like things start to come through in, um, I don't want to say non-real, but things beyond your normal sensorium, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 as, as cool as all the neuroscience has, has gotten the, the very harsh reality is that we have no idea still how to translate between your subjective experience and what the brain is doing. We know they're related. Um, and we know this from all the neuroimaging and especially from the brain stimulation, you can go and poke and prod the brain and people will have 
certain kinds of experiences. We know that's the case, but um, why that's the case? What is the underlying mechanism? What is it about these neurons or, or something about your neural tissue or something about the electrical field that your neural tissue supports? What is it about that that makes you have an experience? We don't really know. Uh, there's over 200 theories about it. There was actually a paper that just came out a couple weeks ago. This guy did an incredible amount of work. He did a full taxonomy of all of the theories of consciousness. And this includes all the different brain-based theories to everything like um, maybe consciousness is the fundamental substrate of reality and that that's where we begin is with consciousness and then the matter is somehow created by consciousness. But Mm -hmm. No matter what approach you take, whether you put matter first or consciousness pr first or, or some other, you know, immaterial substance that somehow unites both of them, you're still left with this incommensurable problem of how do you translate between the biological tissue that we can poke and prod and measure and the subjective feelings and experiences that people have. And, you know, I don't know if it's a question that science will figure out this century. It, it, it might be one of those things that is um, such a massive challenge that um, each time we, we like we may unlock some new understanding of quantum biology that um, we, we can get. We, we can get a, a, a bit better impression of like, oh, it's this part of, you know, the resonating microtubules in the neurons that that is where it really clicks. But there, it still leaves this question of like, OK, but why? Like, what, what is it about that type of, of quantum coherence that you should have an experience? Why, you know, does that mean all quantum coherence has an experience? Does that mean all experience has uh, a related quantum coherence to it um it's you know and th this is known as the hard problem of consciousness well i'll get to work on it see what i can come up with here for now yeah so next time we uh, talk i want you to have this figured out randall okay so let's learn more about the um the transcranial focused ultrasound and what you what you do with right that. and right okay let's where did that tool come from and what is the potential of that tool right right so i mentioned earlier the focused ultrasound so this is a new kind of non-invasive brain stimulation that is in it's another thing that's in a very exciting place right now um <clears throat> it's just being developed it's there's about um 10, I want to say 10, 10 to 15 years of, of research on it, on the brain, maybe closer to 10. Um, we've been using ultrasound for imaging for a very long time. Um, you can use high intensity focused ultrasound for surgery. Like people will use that to break up kidney stones non-invasively. There's a lot of uses for ultrasound. And so this new one is low intensity focused ultrasound you can change the way neurons and neural tissue fires. And this is a really awesome tool because we can penetrate deep brain structures, like um, for those who are familiar, like the thalamus or the cingulate cortex and all, all the other brain stimulation tools <clears throat> like transcranial direct current stimulation. That's where you put a couple electrodes on someone's head, you run electrical current, across and you hope that some of that electrical current is going to influence neural firing in its, in its pathway and this has there's a lot of different ways to do this and and it it has some interesting use cases but you can only ever really get the cortex the the outer the most outermost layer of your brain another one that also gets a lot of use is called transcranial magnetic stimulation and with this, you can get really high spatial accuracy and you can either uh, activate or deactivate your target, but you're still limited to just this outer cortical layer. Whereas mm -hmm. with focused ultrasound, you can put this instrument anywhere on the head and you can go 
several centimeters in, you can go 50, 60, 70 centimeters in if your instrument is built for it. And you can penetrate these super deep areas of the brain that we otherwise would have needed surgery to, to target. Mm -hmm. And so that alone makes it, um, you know, a totally different beast when it comes to non-invasive brain stimulation. And um, it's something that, you know, just in the time that I've been working on it since 2020, I've seen the awareness of it really start to take off. When I started, it felt like no one had really heard of it. And then now um, it feels like pretty much everyone's heard of it, especially in the, in the, mm. in the, in the brain spaces that I, that I interact with. Every, everyone's now heard of it and it's all, and everyone is, well, everyone has different opinions on its, on its potentials. Um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Um, and so there's a, so, okay, you can target all these different parts of the brain. Great. Um, what should we do with it? And our, our group thought it would be cool to try to use this to boost meditation. And so earlier when I was telling you about the default mode network, your default mode network has a few main hubs, the, the, the two most critical ones to the network are the medial prefrontal cortex, which is just right here, right behind your forehead. And then an area mm -hmm. called the posterior cingulate cortex, which is in the cingulate cortex. So it's kind of inside, it's beneath your outer cortex and it's inside here, right, at, right in the center. And that's the part that we are targeting with the ultrasound. So we usually put the transducer that's what emits the ultrasound. That's what we call it. We put it right around here on, on people's heads and the beam goes through the skull and into this deep region of the brain. So why the posterior cingulate cortex or the PCC? And that comes from the meditation research. So, you know, I told you that meditators, they can turn down their default mode network um, once they get good at it. Um, specifically the PCC seems to have this crucial role that it plays. <clears throat> There's research by a guy named Judd Brewer, where he talks about the, the, the phrase that he uses is getting caught up in experience. So the PCC seems to be, or it seems to be related. I don't want to make an equivocation. It seems to be related to that part of you that will grasp onto your experience and identify with it or get caught up in it. You know how all of a sudden a thought occurs to you and then you're kind of captured by that thought or you're, you're, you're captured by, by a, a memory or, or a story or something like that. And all of a sudden you're really caught up in it and you're stuck there. We would expect there to be a lot of PCC activity that would be related to that versus mm -hmm. if you can kind of figure out how to relax that muscle that always wants to grasp at things and you can let that go and allow your thoughts to move more freely through your sensorium, through your inner experience, we would then see less PCC activity. And so what we're trying to do is target this area, target the PCC and inhibit it or disrupt its activity and try to turn it down so that the instrumentation can act as a sort of training wheels for the brain to try to guide people into these deeper spaces where they're no longer grasping at their experience. But all of a sudden mm -hmm. instead, it's like, and, and the way it feels to me, honestly, it sometimes feels like it's this kind of inner massage of my cognitive activity. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, you know, when you get a really good massage and you feel the tension release and the muscle relaxes, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like that, but for your cognition. 